Welcome to the Rebel Love Show. We are a once a week broadcast from Manchester, New Hampshire, where we are pro pot, pro gun, and pro coffee. We are syndicated on voluntary virtues, and we are also uh, on YouTube. Uh, you can find us on Stitcher. You can also find us on iTunes, and uh, go like go uh, like us on uh, Facebook. I am Rob Mathias, and I am Shire Dude. And today we have two great guests. We have uh, Brett Vinat yes. uh, of School Sucks Podcast and the new face of the uh, Free State Project, none other than Allie Havens. Hey, guys. How's it going? <laughs> Doing pretty good. All right. Uh, if you didn't know, I just took that off. I couldn't take it. The, the delay. The yeah. delay. It was like it was like a, an echo chamber in my mind. In my mind, I just couldn't take myself talking that much and hearing myself. Well, you made it almost okay? half a minute. Yeah. What? You made it almost half a minute. I know I did make it almost half a minute, but I couldn't take it any much longer. But uh, anyways, uh, first off, I just want to say that uh, um, we've coming up right this weekend. We got Shire sharing. Uh, there's a big. Uh, charity event going on a volunteerist charity where uh, a bunch of people in the community are going to get together they were going to pack a bunch of, of uh, baskets to feed the homeless and then deliver that on sunday i know myself i don't know if you're are you going to be uh there sunday i'm not sure i'm like a maybe for all okay. well i'm going to be there filming so uh that's excellent yeah i think i should film at least some of that or most of it i want to i want to film from like uh like packaging all the way to like delivery of a yeah uh, as someone who had to like in one of my recent productions uh, it's like this too the episode i did with amanda bolden um i had to use like footage that's been recycled over and over and over again so that's that's really good that you're doing that yeah i want yeah. I, i'm gonna film a bunch of stuff have a bunch of bunch uh videos on my raw channel cool. so cool um but anyways uh so 101 came out and uh, that was amazing. Hence the new face of the Free yeah. State Project. That was an exciting project to work on because when um, Bo and Vince, who were kind of um, producing it all together, messaged me to ask me to be the host of it, I was like, just y if you guys don't know about um, Derek J's victimless crime spree, anyone who hasn't seen that should see it because you can watch it for free online. And uh, Bo had... I knew that he edited that, and all of his editing has always been really good. So, you know, if you're a good editor, then I'll, you know, do free work for you. <laughs> oh, I, I was l waiting in anticipation for 101 because uh, both uh, me and Shire Dude here, we both signed the intent to move after watching Victimless Crime Spree. Oh, wow. So, that's what for, did it, yeah. Yeah, for like for me, like it was the, uh, um, it was literally like, you know, I'm a fan of his work. Like, I was, like, waiting. This is, like, the spiritual successor to Victimless Crime Spree. You're a fan of Derek's work or Bo's work? Or both? Oh, both. Yeah. I, absolutely both. But uh, I know what uh, Bo is capable of in editing, so I was really looking forward to seeing this documentary. I was able to see it uh, at the Quill with a whole bunch of people on the big screen and whatnot, and, th like, that was kind of, like, a full circle moment uh, for me in uh, in the Free State Project because, like, I watched his film and then I come, you know, full circle, and I'm here watching his new work. And then like, you're in it now. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You're in oh, the work too. Yeah, that was that was that was, uh, that was pretty cool. That was actually pretty amazing. So were you? You were like here in the beginning. Anyway. Five times I counted. So <laughs> why did you? Uh, why did you guys? If that was what made you sign for the Free State Project, why did you uh, come to Manchester instead of Keene? Good question. Oh, that is a good question. You can go first on this one. Um, I was actually looking uh, for like job transfers in both locations because there are there are two where I work in Starbucks. There's two of those in Keene and Manchester, I believe, and Manchester's just the first one that picked me up. Also, I'm kind of more of a city person, so yes, yeah. For me, like also city. I mean, I came from uh, South Side of Chicago, so going to Keene would be like. You know, literally living in, on a farm in, in <laughs> perspective. You know, uh, Manchester to me feels like a small town. It's a tiny town in my. my oh, opinion. absolutely. With a t with a pretty mediocre skyline, compared. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Yeah. It's but the biggest place I've ever lived, but that's really it compares experience. Yeah, I mean, oh. Keene. I've only lived in three places. Keene was half the size of my hometown, and then Manchester is much bigger than either one. It went from 40,000 to 20,000 people in Keene, and then Manchester has how many? Hundreds I, I of thousands? I think 100. 100 yeah, it's 000? around 100,000 people in yeah. Manchester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, but yeah, I I grew up in a uh, a count. I lived in Cook County, which had like you know eight million people, and I moved to mm-hmm. Manchester, that has a hundred thousand people in the city. That's where Dr. Richard Kimball worked. What in, in Cook County Hospital? Oh, Dr. Richard Kimball? No, nothing. No, the I fugitive. Oh, the fugitive, Harrison Ford. Yeah, yeah, oh. yeah. Because never... a big place. You do realize that, too. I'm sure it's huge. You've yeah. never seen The Fugitive. I have seen The Fugitive a long time ago. Yes. Yeah. yeah. When you watched it, were you like, I know that place and that place? See, I, I'm from Ki- <laughs> I'm actually from Kaima City, Illinois. So, like, my big thing was the big, uh, was the, the Blues Brothers growing up. So, that was, like, our – because they're from Kaima City. So, that was, like, my <laughs> big, huge movie that everyone loved when I was a kid was, like, watching the Blues Brothers. Hmm. Um, but, anywho, movies about Illinois – um, but no, I moved to Manch. I moved to Manch because uh, I really was inspired by a lot of Liberty media, but it seemed like most of it was coming out of Keene. And I knew just by doing all my research and stuff like that that Manch was really like kind of the hub of the FSP because there's like, you know, what is it, close to 500 people or more that live in the surrounding area of Manchester. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really felt like I, my talents could be better suited here than they would be in Keene, because I figured they got Keene covered. You know, Keen, you know, Ian, Aloran, you know, everyone there, they got Keene. Keene's saturated. Uh, it's in saturated. Liberty. There wasn't enough coming out of Manchester, so I figured, like, I'll it's help. It's super saturated, if anything, you know, like when you heat it up and add more sugar. That's what's <laughs> happened to Keene. They really heated that shit up. They, oh, they, they, they heated the hell out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I remember when I lived in Keene, and we would – go to events in Manchester or maybe Manchester people would come to Keene I would be like there's this whole other part of the Free State Project and I can't remember anyone's names like I know I should know these people and so I felt like I felt like separated from the majority of what's going on in New Hampshire because Keene is all by itself like there's nothing in between anywhere in Manchester and in New Hampshire and Keene that you'd want to go to except for Keene that I can think of so it's just a lot of driving through nowhere Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. See, you know, for me, though, I do try to um, visit Keene as much as I can. And uh, sometimes the coast and the lakes region and whatnot. I'm probably in Keene once every, like, five or six weeks or whatnot. Um, because, in all honesty, I don't want to be just Manchester centric. You know, yeah. I, I like to go to meetups elsewhere and meet everyone in the project and just not in the project, just locals as well and just get out and not just stay in one spot and besides new hampshire's small like everything's an hour's drive away so it's not like yeah keen's like you know five hour drive no, it's like an hour 45 hour 45 that's how oh. long it to be that's how long i leave myself to make it out no there. It, hour 15 at the most no way yeah what do you do i just from here i just take the 101 and it's like an that's hour 15 you take drive. the 101 yeah. and do it in an hour and 15 huh yeah Wow, was that a was that a? Uh, do you guys have drops, I, or did I just hear a bird? No, that was my uh, phone. I did not have it on silent. So <laughs> oh, okay. So I was. Uh, I had it on, <laughs> so waiting for you to message me when you were at the door, and I forgot to. My first two guesses were wrong. Yeah. <laughs> it's so. a bird. It's a plane. <laughs> but uh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of drops, I don't know why more shows don't do that. I drops. think if I ever have oh. another show, I'm going to include drops. They're lots of fun. Yeah. Yeah. I know um, Conan does that really good on Black Sheep Rising. He does drops mm-hmm. a lot. Um, that's that's a lot of prep work, though, to do drops for a podcast. Like, you have to hit it just right. Um, like, you have to have it all queued up. And you have to be kind of magical about it. Yeah, that's... Um, unless you had a producer sitting there just waiting to do a drop, if you're talking and like, running a show and doing the drops, that's like you're, that's like being a singer... And playing guitar at the same time. Like, you've got multiple things going on all at once. And can you imagine once you've trained your brain to think of, like, appropriate drops to input into conversations, how that would last after the show? And you'd be hearing <laughs> drops all day in oh, your conversations. Man, and you'd yeah. want to say them, but you know you can't because that's just weird. I think I talk in drops sometimes. I think, yeah, no matter how socially unacceptable, I do that. Can uh-huh. you think of an example? Like, when you break out in a song, when somebody says a phrase <laughs> from a song. Yeah. That's a drop, right? Yeah, that's like, true. Yeah. Do yeah. you have a do you have like a playlist that you will hit or it could it be any song? It yeah, like I won't know till I get there. Like I couldn't list them for you right now, but if you said that one thing, I don't know. 
I'll, I'll have to pay attention to the rest of the show to see if I can do it. Yeah, yeah, and I'll be ch- testing you. Awesome. So stay tuned, people. Well, why don't you just start <laughs> doing that? Like, why don't you just get like a, you know, they, didn't they have like as I remember as kids they had those like what was a yammer or something like that where you can record like <gasps> the to, yak back. Like, yeah, is that what, I love the yak that's back. That's like the man. that's like the that's like the equivalent of doing drops in what person. What is it? I don't know. What you this just is. record yourself into a little like handheld microphone thing that's about as big as a cell phone. It's a little more clunky. Yeah, though. yeah. And then you could play it back at people. And like, wow. you just had that one recording that you played back at people. I remember the little keychain songs that you could get in your Happy Meals at McDonald's and like clip them into something mm-hmm. and play the song. But mm. the sounds similar. Is it like that? I think they had like yak backs at McDonald's okay. at one point. Yeah. 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 I don't. Uh, I don't know. Little ones. Yeah. Anyways. Um, so uh, I had a question for both of you guys while you're here or whatnot, because. Uh, uh, here, here's the kind of uh, I want to I want to change subjects because we already talked about uh, 101, which is a great film. I'm I'm absolutely in love oh, with that. Film. 101 or yeah, 101 reasons yeah, film yeah, 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 com yeah, yeah. for you watching. Um, so go watch go watch that, kids. Uh, but uh, okay. One thing that I've noticed about this community is there's things you avoid to do, and I, I would be honest, probably everyone at this table has not avoided doing that. Um. <laughs> And that's dating in the community. All right. Um, now, you guys have a perspective. Now, I, I, each one of us uh, at this table is dating someone in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, Two people at this table are dating each other. Yes. I know. That's why you bring, <laughs> so, you, you bring an it's interesting... It's pretty incestuous. It, it's a, it is <laughs> incestuous. <laughs> that's, that's my thing. Yeah. Now, I, um, I spent... I waited a long time to do to actually date in the community. I was purposely dating outside of the community when I moved here. Uh, I've heard of people doing that. Yeah, I did yeah. it for a long time. Makes uh, sense. I remember coming here being like, I'm never going to just be someone who goes from person to person in the community. It's like, and then, yeah, I mean, I just think it's silly because that was part of the reason I wanted to come here is because libertarian and dude, something about it just seems so hot to me. So, mm-hmm. well, you have, well, the, uh, at the time you're, you're when I lived mar- in Alabama, well, well it's not in that true. situation, the you have there. a lot more market uh, strength in that regard. Yeah, yeah you because have there's more less market women. value. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, but uh, for me, I've seen like a lot of drama that has unfolded in front of my eyes when I got here with couples, um, and seeing like past drama be you know c- come back up and whatnot. Yeah, look at Mark and Ian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but eventually I introduced someone to the community and I dated someone else in the community. Um, so I, I've gone complete opposite of what I tried not to do. Um, I did it because I thought it was worth the risk. Um, but why, why does everyone... What is all... it that you feel like you're risking? I feel like the, the, there's such a huge risk in it because I don't want there to be drama in my life everywhere I go. Yeah, you know, because like everyone's I, gonna know. Everyone the knows. Everyone, you're everyone talks. It's everyone small. Knows. Yeah, it's a small community. I mean, Manchester's a small town, and you're gonna see that person everywhere. After, yeah, you know, like you know, every, every other meetup. It's kind you of go like we're still in whatnot. high school, <laughs> to so, some level. Because if you guys are used to living in cities, and you know, you date a, I don't, I just, I don't know what it's like, you know, to live to date around in a city. Do you just date strangers? Like, is it like you really don't know the people you see, and then? You get what you want to have the date, or you don't, and then you never see the person again, or you do see the person again, but it doesn't really matter either way because you can ch- it's you can just choose if you never want to see them again. Basically, I have almost no experience with that. Like Me college, that was you date people who go to the college. Now I went to it's interesting because I went to a small college, like less than two thousand people, so everybody there is a celebrity. And I did some spectacularly stupid things while I was in college and everybody knew about it right away. So I, I think this wasn't that new to me, this idea of being in a fairly, you know, insular situation like this. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are risks with what you're saying. I can see why people would be apprehensive about just jumping right into dating here. What about, what about you, Shire, dude? Why, 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 did you, why are you making the risk? Why am I? Why am I taking the risk? Because yeah, I, why are you taking yeah, it? Yeah, I only lasted like six months before I started dating someone. Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm more of a just kind of like 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 seize the day mentality. Like, I. 
You know, I, I actually, it's interesting because my, like all of my exes from the past, I, I didn't talk to. I don't think I really kept a single one as a friend. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's a little unsettling, right? Because then I, I don't want that to happen to someone in this community specifically. Yeah. 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 It's, a, it's a huge risk to have an ex in the community. Though. Yeah. I Especially definitely, if you run into them a lot. Like, I've, I've kind of picked up the, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but I, I don't want to burn any bridges in this community because it's still, it's too small, you know? And even if someone, like, really ticks me off, and it could be dating, it could be something else, um, I, I'd want to keep the lines of, like, communication open, and I wouldn't want to, like, try to, like, shun or ostracize anyone. Yeah, I had a policy kind of like the police have, like, be, what, are the, what, what, did, what did the police say? Be nice to everybody, even though they're not. This is just something they say. But polite to nobody but that's not i mean i i don't really it, my difference is like be friendly but don't you know I, I i had an attitude when i got here like to manchester i came here in 2010 that everybody needed to be kept at just about arm's length yeah. you know and like i saw a lot of what you're talking about rob like people getting too close together too fast not realizing that just because they came here and they have similar interests or similar beliefs that it's not instantaneous friendships and then you know these uh, problems develop and then but people have gotten so close to each other and then they have other friends and they're pulled into whatever the conflict is and it gets very messy so i said okay well i want to avoid all that and uh it was just i think that went on for a while and then as time went on people just started to get closer like it felt safe to let some people get closer than that but it didn't, it, I mean, I knew just from like my prior experience in small or closed communities that just because of proximity or even similar interests, it wasn't going to be instantaneous magical friendships. So um, it took years, I think, to really find a, a core of friends. And I mean, even though and I, I knew right away it wasn't going to be everybody, it turned out to be very few people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've uh, I've gone through different like friends since I've gotten here because you kind of like you, you as soon, for me when as soon as I got here I uh, I try to be as a social butterfly like meet as many people as I can. And to be honest, I still do that. I still go to as many meetings when I see people I don't you know I haven't met before. And it's yet, so easy know. to be one here too with all with all the meetups and things that happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm already building my core group of like you know networking of friends that I get, I go out with and whatnot. Um, but it took a while. I mean, I've, I've only been here 10 months, but uh, it's, it's starting to build where I have like that more core group of people compared to what it was before, I, you know, when I first got here. Because when I first got here, like I don't know anyone really. I mean, I know people online before I moved here, but I didn't like, you know, really know people. Um, but I definitely kind of feel like I'm getting to the point where I've built that, that core like network, that network of people to like th that are friends that I, you know, I see on a weekly basis daily basis now yeah I think that's really important that's like real security is having n having intimate relationships with like a good group of friends are they all friends with each other too or is it like no these are just like random people who don't even necessarily know each other for the most part they all know each other they're all friends everyone hangs out from you know that's the best yeah that is the best it, it really really is um, especially in what you know how I'm living my life that's actually uh, works out for the best by, by a long shot um, I used to actually keep uh, these, like how I said before, like dated outside of the community. Like I kept it, not just outside of the community. Like I kept them um, completely out, like I out of the state, out of town, out of town. <laughs> I was, I was <laughs> dating, a, I was dating a woman from uh, down in Mass. So like, I was, it was like completely, online only. <laughs> she was like a whole separate, like I compartmentalized. Like all right, you're just part of my life a couple of days a week, way over here, and that is it. You know, you're not, yeah. you're not even. You know, she's just a toll-free number that you call every now and then. <laughs> no, no, no. She was, no, she was she was amazing at the time. But okay. Like, uh, you know, I, I at, at the end of the day, that was kind of the, the wrong way to go about it because you know we kind of hold up. You know, I talk about how like you know the risk of dating in the community, which is a risk, but at the same time, like I moved here to live my life. You know, I'm going to be around people. I'm not going to. If I'm not going to hide who I am out in the real, you know, the, the world around us, why am I going to hide who I am around the people I moved here for? Yeah. Sure. You know, um, and I kind of came to that realization like about a 
I would say in July. So I've been here since January. It took like almost six months, but I finally came to that realization that I'm not going to do that anymore. But I always find it interesting um, when other people in the community like start dating other people in the community because I always feel like there is there's definitely a risk involved in doing it. I yeah, see that. I think it's weird that when people date each other, they share all their secrets and then they break up on bad terms. That just seems and it like to and then they never see, want to see each other again or they even like hate each other kind of and I could see that maybe if it's like well we got together and then things changed or you know I don't know circumstances changed or something you know but or maybe something came up that challenged them and then they realized they weren't really right for each other but I don't understand like this once finding this person valuable enough to like want to kind of spend all your time with them and like share your most intimate stuff with them and then to like reject them completely it just seems like i don't know perhaps it's a defense mechanism maybe i've never really uh, related to that like i've always just been like well i loved you when we were in the relationship why would i just stop loving you just because i don't want to continue the relationship no ab absolutely like for me i'm not going to uh like i have uh exes here now and in all honesty like i'm not going to like i don't stop caring for like the people that I was with, like I'm no longer like you know I don't want to be intimate with them. I don't have that like feeling of love for them, like I, as if I'm with you know I'm their you know partner, I'm their couple, I'm, I'm with them. Um, but uh, doesn't mean I don't stop caring for them. You know, like I want them to be happy. I, I think that would be kind of I weird. See them, if I see them, I'll give them a hug. If you could honestly say or, like, oh, you know, oh that person I was in love with before, well we broke up, so now I don't give a shit about them. It's like <laughs> that doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have tried to, I wouldn't say maintain friendships, but be on good terms with everyone that I had been in a relationship with, you know, prior to this. Now, I do have one ex who is part of the community. We are not on good terms, uh, but I don't run into her all the time. And she has been uh, very respectful of, you know, my privacy, what our privacy was. So it's not like we're all like, you know, every morning walking out of, a, you know, our dorm rooms and facing each other, you know. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, like, I haven't seen this person in five or six months and they live in the same town. And even though... You know, the ending of the relationship was not ideal, and if I accept more than 50% of the responsibility for what happened. Um, it hasn't produced uh, a lot of drama um, that I know about anyway. And I, 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 I think this is somebody who is, you know, respectful and discreet and mature. And, um, you know, a lot of people here are, and certainly anyone I would want to be involved with. So it's, it's I, I can see the danger, but even though... I'm kind of like, in some ways, the cautionary tale. It hasn't really been um, that bad. Well, I mean, usually the the risk is because you know people go to the same meetups and the same events. Sure. You know, like yeah. normally, like if when you before you moved, like when you broke up, usually that breakup caused like they went with their friends, you went with your friends, and mm -hmm. you really never saw them all that often, if ever again, unless it was at a huge party or something like that. Here, everyone kind of you know. It's still to the point where, like, yeah, you can get along, you can get get out, and where you're not seeing each other people, um, like other people in the community. But you still, there's still major events you go to, or even if you're in the same city, you might go to the same meetup from time to time and run into those people again. This is why we need to trigger the move. Yeah. Yeah, trigger the move so there's no more drama <laughs> in dating. You can so just there's date as many people as you want, yeah. and like you won't, you don't have a, a huge chance of seeing them because there's so many of us. Yeah. Right. It's like risk. Madison Square Garden everywhere you go. <laughs> well, that's why I think people should try to resolve their differences if it's like causing uncomfortable feelings about going to events and stuff like that you don't want that just best to resolve it but it made me think about like a friend from the free, that I met through the free state project that we were really close and then we I say that we broke up because it was like super dramatic the way like a breakup would happen and you know some and sometimes you like try to resolve things with people and they just like won't have it they're like no I'm gonna be mad at you forever, or or like it doesn't it doesn't oh, matter if you're if you want to make nice. I'm not interested. I don't know if that kind of thing just comes in, in time, but what do you do then? It's just kind of like okay, so it's just gonna to continue to be weird forever. Yeah, I've had situations not with exes, but like just with friends that like there was a fallout here. Mm -hmm. And I uh, mean, making friends is risky for that reason it too. It is, yeah, because you know? it's just this kind of same thing where like 
had I had a grudge held against me for the longest time, and now it's kind of over. Thank God. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's a risk. But I, sometimes there's definitely bigger risk because you know that because it is kind of incestuous. Like sometimes you know you sit across the table and like okay, this person had sex with that person, da da da, and you kind of like picture in your mind, and that's one thing that sometimes kind of throws me for a loop a little bit when you notice that like yeah when when you're going to looking um, at your Eskimo family tree <laughs> <laughs> right yeah um and and I would I mean I've had sex with almost no one here so there's that you know and I think that even if there was just more of that kind of casual stuff going on that uh, I I never you know this is just me this is just my perspective but I didn't see how that could work for me you know like I guess some people handle that fine you know and good for them it just wasn't um something that i was comfortable with it wasn't something that i felt like i would be able to do and and i'm kind of like i i think i'm older than a lot of people who are here too like i don't know how old you guys are but i'm 37 talking about casual sex more casual you know um that i was just kind of over that by the time i got here i'd had enough i had no idea you were 37 Thank you. Well, wait. Did you? Did you? Didn't think I was like sixty. Well, you know what? You know, we, uh, everything I've ever, <laughs> no, every time I've ever seen a picture. Like, for first off, we've only I only met both of you guys. Like, our my path didn't really cross with you guys until like a week ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, which I find kind of surprising. I don't know. Usually, my well, what's my, weird is I was like, oh, it was one of those in- instances where I was like. For some reason, when I saw him in person, I think I've seen you in person like lots of times. No, we, and not known that you were the Facebook you it was just like my photo i know that's the weird thing is that i'm always complaining about people not having their actual photo on facebook because i can't tell them apart and you did and i still couldn't like for some reason make the connection in my mind that is a huge pet peeve of mine is when people don't use their face on facebook listen you'll be honest i use facebook as like my whole dossier of the free state project and whatnot and when someone doesn't have their photo on there and they have like you know porcupine or like i won't an edward snowden or whatever i don't right. know and i'm like come on i need if i go to like a meetup all right and they introduce themselves like i don't know who they are like i, I see i might be friends with them on facebook but i don't know i, I want to see who you are right you i want your profile picture to be a headshot and i want your cover photo to be like a full body you lying sideways, <laughs> you know. I want not only to know what your face looks like. I want to have a I, what? How tall are you? What body type do you have? So when I see you in fir- person for the first time, make no mistake, I know who you are. Yeah, yeah. But no, we did. We did. Uh, I, I know I've seen you guys a couple times around. Like I know a convention. I, I yeah, yeah, we yeah, did. Yes, panel, yes, that's right. Get a chance to, like to come up and talk to you guys or whatnot. Did you know who we were? I know who both of you were before I moved. Ah, ah. How about that, Allie? I, mean, yeah. I feel special. I used yeah. to listen to Ali on Free Talk Live. Me too. What? Yeah, and I might have heard Brett stuff before too, but cool. I actually had never seen Brett until I got here. Yeah. So wait, why were we talking about my? This age? is like a full circle thing because I remember I know you guys didn't like just just move, but when I just just moved and I was talking to people who I'd been listening to, I remember feeling strange about it. I remember saying hello to someone who I considered a celebritarian, mm-hmm. and being like, "Hi, you know." We're in this position where, like, I know who you are. You don't know who I am, but, like, I'm a fan. <laughs> and the way the person responded was just, like, made me feel so down about having made any kind of deal about meeting them. When they do? It was, they're just kind of like. Who was like, it? Uh, I don't want to say. <laughs> Come on. Just go and say. Who to. was it? I won't, I won't go there. Just because okay. I don't want to. I don't think it was, like, I, can, I will say it was a girl. And I don't think she was realizing Maybe I was being unclear. Like, maybe I was trying to play it down, but really excited. And so her response mattered more to me than I was showing. I don't know. But she just, it was at Pork Fest. And she was just kind of like, oh, hey, cool. And then left, like, that sounds like as if beginning. she didn't, no, it wasn't. No, I can say it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't anyone who lives here. Okay. All right. So, how long did you watch, like pay attention to the FSB before you moved? Because obviously, if you had, if you were fans of people here, you had to have been paying attention for, for like, quite a long time. A little over a year, I was like, I'm moving. I listen to Free Talk Live every day. And what else? Did, just Free Talk Live? Did you listen to anything else or watch anything? I listen to Pork Therapy, Free Talk Live, Freedom Main Radio. Um, those were the main ones, and sometimes I would listen to. Um, what was 
what was Dale's show called back Claiming in the day? Claiming Freedom? It was, oh, it Pr was Prometheus you know, Rising. Prometheus Rising. I used mm -hmm. to listen to that sometimes. And I would listen to, like, Sex, Lies, and Anarchy sometimes because I think it was still on LRN then. I would catch it sometimes. Okay. So I started back, like, all the way in 2006. I found Free Talk Live. That's and awesome. it was um, Mark and Ian and Gardner. Gardner Goldsmith was a, a regular at the time. And I thought it was like the most stimulating conversation that I had ever heard in my life, you know? And I was from New Hampshire. I grew up on the seacoast. And at the time I was living in like the Metro Boston area. So I'm seeing a lot of what freedom doesn't look like, you know, and I was just, I was commuting. I was on the commuter rail all the time or driving. And I was, you know, um, consuming free talk live, like archives like going back and you know listening to them be right about things from like months before and i was like wow these guys are geniuses and this is amazing and um from there i found uh, like complete liberty and then uh west turned me on to uh free domain radio and um i moved back to new hampshire in 2007 actually and wasn't didn't even get involved with the the free state project until 2010. um after i started the show I got a message from Ofer, who lived out by me. I lived like in Newmarket, out by UNH, and he lived in Dover. And he said, hey, I'm a town over from you, and I love your show. Do you want me to make you a website? So we like started hanging out and watching TV shows. And um, I was living with a, uh, my girlfriend at the time, and uh, we broke up, and Ofer and I moved in to together. And we set up like an office, and we watch more TV shows and I'm like, wow, what a nerd, Babylon 5 and you know, all this, but I was hooked, you know? And uh, from there, uh, he went on to the, you know, build the hangout place that we're all familiar with. Can we talk about that like publicly? I, I, nothing's off the table. In okay. Regards to yeah. Cool so, or yeah, whatever. I wasn't sure about that I, I already, No, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> That's when, when, um, when uh, Will goes to Keenvention mm -hmm. and is talking about it on a panel, and when the uh, the manager at the time is the keynote speaker last year, uh, JJ, like I don't think it's I think the secret's out of the bag, in my opinion. So sure. I mean, when they're like the the owner and management of at the time is going on YouTube talking about it. Sure, I, great. I, yeah, I used to think that, was, that like I shouldn't talk about it for a while, but I think I'm like, fuck it. Well, yeah, you, be cool. you don't want to be like uncool or like somehow jeopardizing people or something. Mm -hmm. But that used to scare me about. Um, I know the quill used to kind of freak me out because it's like, I'm not supposed to even, am I even supposed to know about it? Like, was it like, <laughs> like telling me about it? Was that like someone breaching some level of trust? Ooh. And then going to the KC, my, it was like my first day in Keene, someone invited me and then I felt like there was some kind of discussion like, hey man, you can't just do that. And it's like, it's cool, man. She just got here. She's cool. <laughs> I had my sister with me and I think they're like, how do we know she's not a fed? Like, I don't know if they were actually having this conversation, but I sense something like that going on. I made it in there. I guess I checked out, but I remember the quill being similar to that when when it started. But um, yeah, so I Ofer and I lived together when uh, he, him and William started setting it up, and Ofer had helped like everybody for so long, like never asked any like here I'll make you this, I'll make you that, and I was really actually happy when I saw him start you know doing this own his own thing that he was really excited about. And um, from there, like he was the only person I really knew in, I mean, I knew nobody in Manchester. Um, we had a, we lived in a building that, you know, a free stater politician owned and he lived downstairs and a couple other free staters lived upstairs, but I really didn't know anybody. So when that place opened, that was pretty much how I started to meet everybody um, through hanging out there, you know, like four years ago. And then one of my best friends, Osborne, uh, I had met him because he wrote to me uh, about like liking the show. And then he moved here and we kind of started to develop our own, you know, close knit group uh, outside of Manchester. So, uh, yeah, so I was here by 2007, but it wasn't until 2010 that I started getting involved. So I lurked for a long time and it was really like free talk live. And um, that was the only thing that was going on here that I was really um in tune with maybe the ridley report a little bit now and then oh, yeah dave ridley oh dave ridley uh rock but he doesn't really make much videos anymore i don't know what's going on some of on his videos is, he's just opining on foreign affairs and i don't really yeah. listen to those but when he uh, but when he opines on things 
relevant to the Free State Project, then it's always interesting. Very oh, insider. Oh, I used to, I watched Dave Ridley for like a year and a half, like religiously, that and Free Talk Live. Um, I pretty much listened to every pod, mo- almost every podcast that was like on, that was listed on LRN.FM. Mm-hmm. You know, I was listening to all of that. And, uh, Hell, I was even watching like raw videos of like Robin Hooding and shit like yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, like I, it, which was really crazy because like, um, uh, I remember going going to Keene and like going to walking the square. I'm like, I I've seen this through Garrett Ian's camera <laughs> so yeah. much. You know, and it was really it was like wow, I'm actually walking here for something that I watched on on the internet for so long. So you know? surreal. The yeah. gazebo looks a lot smaller. Yeah, it is small. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember mm-hmm. seeing 420 rallies there and whatnot, and it just doesn't look the same as it does in in person. It's a more it looks more epic on camera than it does in person. Mm. Maybe that's why it's a Liberty Media capital of the world cuz so like photogenic that town. Oh, mm-hmm. it, it definitely is a photogenic town. That's that's It looks way better on camera true. than what it actually is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Though I'm kind of I'm like what's what's crazy is it's very it's heart not I guess heartwarming. Um but it's interesting that you said that how you had like, you know, you had a you know, you're a fan or hero or whatnot, which I actually yeah. kind of think who I think I might know who it is. Um, but uh, it's interesting because, like, again, I knew who both of you were before I moved here. I knew a lot of people before I moved here, you know, and I tried to hide that really well before I even came here, you know, especially like when I got here, like, you know, like, oh, I'm, oh, like, hey, how's it going? Like, I know, who, you know, but some people don't like some people move here and th- it's like, they move here with a loved one maybe like they weren't really listening to anything that they, they really don't know who you are so or they don't even know who like you know mark are or anyone you know it's kind of surprising sometimes but oh, yeah. you never know if someone's gonna is someone is into the same kind of media that you've been into yeah well it was crazy is i had like a really like again i listened to free talk live for like two years before i moved and I had a very uh, surreal first 24 hours um, living here. Um, my first 24 hours living here, I, uh, I landed in Manchester around like 4 o'clock. Um, I took an Agris taxi cab from my apartment that I was renting to Area 23 where they picked up an extra passenger who happened to be Rich Paul. So he was literally the second free stater <laughs> I met here in an Agris cab to area 23 where i met a bunch of other people i already kind of recognized and whatnot then i go to the quill um after that and meet other people that i recognize and then i the next literally the next morning i take that same agarist cab to Keene, to the cac and i buy a car in bitcoin and then i'm like <laughs> being interviewed in the lrn studio it's and like stuff a dream like that or something. it was really surreal considering yeah. like you know i've been watching all this going on and yeah. i was like now i'm like i'm living it. and to be honest i've been living this since i got off that plane and uh, it's coming up to almost a year now and i haven't stopped like i literally f- have not stopped moving like you're, we're in we're in my apartment right now i don't even have a tv in here you <laughs> know what i'm saying because like besides yeah. doing this i'm always out i'm always doing something i'm always going somewhere you know that's a good i mean that's a good thing you don't want to be like some kind of someone who like mo- uh, apparently there are people who move for the free state project they li- i guess they fucking buy a house and they just live there and like don't tell anyone that they're they don't make any announcement they're not hey we're coming they just they're like we're just waiting we're just waiting until we have li- as much liberty and then i guess we'll come out i don't know here's a question for you. how many people have you met at like a new movers party or a meetup that you never saw again I, I feel like that happens a lot, but yeah. not yeah. just at the parties, but yeah, just meeting people and then they're gone. Never meet Yeah, they them. just disappear. No, you know, it's weird. Like, so, like people come in and you'll see them for like a week or two or something like that at different events uh, or different meetups or somewhere along the line. Like, you know, oh yeah, I just moved to Manchester, da da da, and then I never Maybe see them again. Maybe they're moles. I come and go, you know? Like, I've been very connected at times and then just kind of retreat into my own world for. A you year? said never see again, though. Oh, people will see. You'll well, see mind me you, again. I've only been here 10 months. So, I mean, right. though, it does feel like, I don't know if you would, uh, you guys would agree to this, um, but to me, sometimes living here a week can feel like a month, like time-wise. Like, I feel like I've been here for years. I don't feel yeah. like I've been here just 10 months. I feel like I've been here like three or four, well, at least two or three years. Like, there are people I've known who lived here for a while, and then they, they like, moved back or moved away. And that's always been 
s- sort of sad for me. Like, oh, you came here and then you left? I remember hearing about that before I moved and being like, why? How could they, like, how? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, if you got there, then how could you ever leave? I just imagine it doesn't matter, you know, there's no job market or, like, the food's way more expensive. I don't know whether, or, like, it's too cold, but all the libertarians are there. That just sounds awesome. Well, wait a minute. Well, I'm just saying, you know, after a while, maybe it starts to lose its appeal because after you know everyone, you've made these connections. But if you get get here and then you move right away, well, there's always yeah, connection. right away, like because we're we've he actually says, wait talked. a minute because we're thinking about going to Mexico. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. But not for like a while. Yeah. Okay. Can well, I ask, what's the what's the appeal there? Lots of appeals. Uh, you can start with your appeals. Well, first of all, my sister um, and her lover both live there his name is mike did you guys meet them or did, no i guess neither of them neither of you would have met them no. they did co- they do come to pork fests and they live in mexico so we were thinking about moving to the island of, of cozumel which is where they live um and then also i mean brett makes his money online so if i could get a job online then that would mean that we both have income coming in and then everything's cheaper so it goes a lot further and well, it's really warm all year. Why don't you just get a summer home, I mean a winter home down there, and then come up here for the summer? Have the best of both worlds. There might be, well, then we should get that out of here. Let's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. let's try to get out of here in the next it's week. It's already starting to freeze, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, something, it's something like we're in the that's initial a, that's stages. That's my dream life, is living in Mexico in the winter and then coming back to New Hampshire for uh, the summer. That actually wouldn't be bad because even like offsetting – uh, the cost of living here, like three months, you know, in Mexico, because I mean, I make the the same amount of money comes in every week, yeah, or not every week, but every month. So if for three months I can be like a Mexican peso millionaire, uh, <laughs> that would actually help. I mean, it, d- depending on what the costs are of going back and forth and getting set up there, even three or four months down there might might make a big difference. And if it doesn't, at least I'm living it up while I'm there. So uh, I'm interested in the idea of expatriation, you know, like I, I see all the value in being here. But for me personally, as an individual, um, you know, the way uh, my life works, it might be might ultimately be better to be somewhere else. I don't like the idea of being trapped in the U.S. No, I, I, I definitely get that. Um, I'm only here because the FSB, to be perfectly honest, like I probably would have left the country by now. If it wasn't for the FSP, uh, I had a dream to. Uh, I really wanted to drive down to Belize and just like find a place to live and work down there. What kind that, of drive would that be? I have no idea. It's a very long drive, probably like a two day drive, if that. I looked at uh, Belize is what just south of Mexico. Yes. Three days. I I I did the. I actually did the route to the route to um, <coughs> Cancun, which is about as close as you can get to Cozumel. Uh, and it, it was like almost three days to there. So Belize would probably be about three days. That was some wrapping around, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You mean just a wrapping around? Peninsula. Wait. No. What is it called when the water comes in? The a cove? Gulf. Coves and yeah. gulfs. and Gulf of Mexico. Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. 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 They won't let you take your car there as the crow flies. you got to f- follow the land. Yeah. We don't, <laughs> have, we don't have flying cars yet, unfortunately. Yeah. You know. Um, but no, I, I, I'm only here for the FSP. If, uh, that, if this community didn't exist, I wouldn't be here. Um, I don't plan to leave, uh, for the most part. I, I wouldn't mind having a summer home down south of the border, though. If I can make enough money doing something, I would love to do that at some point. That'd be the real dream, because it does get cold up here. Not that I really don't mind the cold. I come from a cold climate as it is, so actually a colder climate than here. Windy. Windy, windy. I came from Chicago where it's very windy and cold. And yeah. It gets a hell of a lot colder than it gets here. Wow. The wind is the worst, like, a, a, as far as cold goes. Like, yesterday it was so much windier, and it was just, it was way worse compared to today, even though I think the temperature wasn't much different. So, yeah, the wind makes a big difference. I got it. House swap. We need to find a family of Mexican skiing fanatics. There you go. <laughs> right? We want them to be rich and have lots of children, and they won't mind living in, like, a two-bedroom apartment where one room is a studio um, for three months while they ski. That's what we need to find. It, 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 it's out, they're it out there. It would be hard to find. As long as they use that studio to make a reality show about them because they, they just sound really, like, fascinating. 
Yeah. 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 It, it, be, it could be a reality TV show, just the, the, the swap. Yeah. The, the like swap. Show the Free us State us Project Swap House. Yeah, it's a white yeah. swap, it's house swap. Yeah. Yeah. They must have a show. There must be a house swap show already. Coming this fall. I'm sure there probably is. Well, I don't know. There must be. If they, if 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 somebody's thought of what's the rule about porn? If somebody's thought of it, there's reality TV of it. Yep. Yeah, now. Pretty much. So how so you make your entire living off of the school sucks project? I do. That's awesome. Yeah. It took a it took a long time to like how many years did it take to get get, get up to because you're like almost coming up on episode four hundred or something, aren't you? Uh, I've been doing the show a little more than five years and I didn't even really try to monetize it until maybe three years ago I started um uh people are always donating like as soon as I put like I was like almost embarrassed to put a donation thing on the site when it was new but then somebody's like if you do it I'll send you money and it only takes five minutes and I said okay well it'd be foolish not to do that and people started to send donations and then I, I just started to look at the other models for podcasts that were monetized and this was you know back in 2011 uh, people had like subscription uh, programs, bonus content sections. So I set one up in 2012 and um, started promoting it, you know, and built it up to like, it's like around, usually it's like around 250, 260 people uh, who pay between like six and $25 a month. So depending on their income. And uh, that's the only way the show has revenue. There's no advertising. We made twenty six dollars from an Amazon affiliates program last month. But oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I need to set that up on our on our website. It's a Amazon affiliate program. But um, for years, I was doing the show for a couple years anyway. In addition to being an educator, you know, I worked as a, a tutor, mainly the SAT tutoring. Um, uh, like maybe seven or eight months before I started the show. I started a tutoring business and we just did exclusively like SAT tutoring. So that's what I've done most of the life of the show. But I kind of learned my way out of enjoying that work, I guess I would I would say. Like the more I learn about what I'm doing, the more I think about what I'm doing, the more I'm like, well, if I, if I don't have to do that, like if I had to do it, like if the show just wasn't monetizable, then I would have to do that and it would be okay. It wasn't the worst job. But like if I have a choice, between doing that or doing this, I'd rather just spend the time doing this and getting people to pay me for it. I think everyone's going to be mad if I if someone doesn't point out that it's not as if the only other way you could possibly have value is an SAT tutor. Oh, sure. I mean, I could paint. I could sing. Really set the bar high for yourself. <laughs> you could do lots of things. Yeah. Being good with kids and, like, being a good educator and also, like, having sort of an unconventional view of what it – what real education is is gonna would appeal to tons of people. Yes, hopefully more over time. But see, that was the really frustrating and thing you can too. Do it all online now too. I mean, people do uh, online tutors from like different countries when there's a language barrier. So, well, I made a I made a uh, a pretty aggressive pitch to the people who are listening, like at the end of last year, and I said, for a long time, I worked in the world of fake education, right? Doing this tutoring, like get better grades, you know, do good on the SAT so you can get into a college and get a worthless college diploma. And I said, that that's fake education. And the market rate, you know, my time was worth 40, 50, 60 dollars an hour in that world, you know. And now I think like this is real education. And suddenly my time is worth nine dollars an hour. And people understood that. And actually a lot of people supported the show because of that. You know, so there there is a market for that, but I I'm really excited about seeing it grow to see you know more people thinking that that work is valuable because um, I think it is. You know, I think it was yeah. pretty much like it's the perfect job for me. It's the perfect thing for me to do. I went to school for communications, you know, like broadcasting and all that. Um, yeah, I had to teach all this all this. I had to teach myself. Like I didn't go to school for anything. No, I had to teach all myself this too because uh, I was in college. I was a freshman in college in 1995. I graduated in the year 2000. We're studying, you know, here's how you use a VHS camcorder. You know, <laughs> here's how you edit a news package. You know, on an editing station that was the size of an entire room. You know, and meanwhile, outside of the school, because I didn't go to a very good college because I wasn't a very good student. 
So they weren't really cutting edge. They weren't up to date with what was happening. So as we learned how to do things the way people did them in like the 70s and the 80s, all those industries were being revolutionized by technology outside of that. So when we graduated, it's like, oh, yeah, I, you know, go to job interviews and be like, yeah, you know, I know how to rub hot wax on paper and then paste it onto a template and have it printed. And like, we don't do that anymore. It's all done with computers. So I had a worthless degree. I had a degree in like commu- mass media and communications history. That did nothing for you. That did nothing for me. Except for start a podcast that you taught yourself how to do. Well, yeah. And I was always like trying to find ways to use the interest, the principles of what I had learned, but I didn't have any skills, right? Like I didn't know how to do anything. Um, when I was a senior in college, we had started to use Adobe PageMaker point, you know, 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah. Uh, and that was like as technical as things got. Everything else was outdated. Everything else that I had learned was outdated by the time I graduated. So I had the interest, and I guess I had some basic principles, like here's how you set up, here's how you edit a news package or something like that. Um, and I, in all the education jobs, I found ways to use those things that I had wanted to do, and eventually it evolved into doing this. So it worked out, I think, or it's working out. I would love to get to the point where, like, you know, uh, both, like, myself here and Shire, we both accept Bitcoin, by the way, if you want to don't. Oh, well, I accept Bitcoin. He accepts Dogecoin. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't have that as, like, a – I would love to have that where I can just live off of, the, off of donations, but I'm, I try to be as realistic as possible. If that ever happened, great. But, you know, I get enough to, like, you know, go buy a pint from, like, Murphy's. So I'm not getting, like, you know, money to, like, where it's going to, like – pay the rent here and pay for my car yeah. and pay for my cell phone bill and stuff like that, you know, or buy food. Mm-hmm. Like I still got to go work a normal, you know, day job out in the matrix out there and, you know, go go amongst like the real world and make a living and then come back here. I mean, some people would say to keep the things that you love as hobbies because then you don't want to be to be like corrupted or something. That's yeah. and it's kind of it's interesting because I don't feel like Brett does. Like, I don't hear him being like, oh, I really have to compromise the content of the show today so I can, you know, make my investors happy. I like, never hear does, you does saying it, stuff like a, that. Does it feel like a job? What she said is like a really good point because like the show seemed more free or the experience seemed more free when I wasn't counting on it to produce income for me, you know? So maybe there's, there's some truth to that. And I, I think... What I, what I wanted to do is have like multiple revenue streams. Um, and I've even thought and even talked about starting another show that we could monetize very quickly with advertising. But I don't want to do advertising with school sucks. But that's really, you know, that's a really good point. Tell like them if, about your show. Yeah, idea. yeah. I, I, I'm very curious of what your, the, their possible new show would be. Oh, it, it would be a give me. Them, give them like your honest opinion. Okay. Right? Yeah. Wait, it's. Is just it like the pitch of the show? All right. Let's hear it. Yeah, let's I, hear the elevator pitch. You're thinking of the kind of healthy guys, right? Yeah. Okay. I thought maybe I told you about another show as a joke. <laughs> no, <laughs> Some okay, other stupid. Um, so, uh, Osborne, do you guys know Osborne? I, I know of him, Heard but of him. I've yeah. not met him before. So, he, he and I just started doing a live show version of School Sucks like in 2012. And we like working together and we're really good friends and, and we have a lot of similar interests. And there's a lot of like health podcasts about like fitness and um, paleo and this stuff. But these people are a little, they're kind of intimidating, right? Like there's this guy, Dave Asprey. He's the bullet. We were talking about Bulletproof Coffee. Well he was aware. he yeah, was the guy yeah. who came Just up with that. Jay Love. She loves that guy. Yeah. So they're he's always ready to one up you. Yeah. He's like, so this, this is Dave Asprey. He comes out, he, this is, this is classic Dave Asprey, right? And just how inaccessible his world is to the rest of us. He claims to be the first guy who ever sold anything online. Right. So he's very, he's very wealthy, has a lot of resources. So he comes out with his rose tinted glasses, which protect him or regulate his circadian rhythms or something. (laughs) His $200 glass. And he comes out to give a speech and he goes, you know, I try to, and I, 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 by the way, I'm trying to get him on my show, so this is, <laughs> but I am going to make fun of him right now. Um, he says to the crowd that's gathered to hear him speak at whatever this conference is, I try to only have one orgasm a month. Pause for, oh, well, what does he mean? You know, from the crowd. And then, but I try to make sure it doesn't last longer than half an hour. 
right? So look how impressive I am. What am I even talking about? You're mystified by me. I'm on a whole other level than you, crowd. <laughs> and I don't think this is like people would listen to this and he like sells this vibrating mat that was invented by NASA for $2,000. He's like, yeah, you just need this. You know, you don't masturbate for a month and then you lie on this NASA mat and, you know, it's six or $7,000 and, you know, you're good. That kind of a thing. So this is inaccessible for most people. So we had this idea of being kind of healthy guys. Like Osborne and I both have health challenges. You know, not like serious illnesses, but we're not like perfectly fit. We're not, uh, we don't have perfect eating habits. We vape, you know, we, uh, what else? Caffeine. You gotta have a yep. vice. You, gotta, you can't be. You go to all you can eat meat night. You go to all we can eat meat night, which, which might actually be okay, which might actually be considered healthy if yeah. you don't, you know, yeah. eat yeah. too much meat. But um, we said, what if we did like a show like this for ordinary guys who just want to like improve their life a little bit like step you know show number one don't smoke cigarettes smoke this <laughs> you know show number two don't drink diet coke it's really bad for you you know just like Wait, little things doesn't osborne love diet coke he does and that would be that would be like a debate right okay. and i could but i used to be totally addicted to diet coke i would drink like five a day and i got off it i don't drink it at all anymore two years well three years ago i used to be uh 310 pounds 40 really what yeah yeah wow. i used to be a, i used to drink like a 40 ounce of mountain dew or, or pepsi like every day i used to know i used to know uh the the menus of every fast food restaurant that there was and i uh i can't, i was already liberated via you know delivery movement and everything like that i liberated my mind you know so if i can liberate my mind i can liberate my body and uh within a year I, cause I made that mental decision to like be healthy, and within one year, I went. I literally went from three ten all the way down to around one seventy five, one eighty. And I How'd kept, you do it? I've, well, I've kept this weight for two years now, so I've been at this weight for literally two years. I did uh, now. I, I pretty much pissed off uh, both uh, paleo and vegans in the mm -hmm. same way. Uh, the first six months, I did uh, Atkins, so paleo. For the most part, very yeah, 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 carb, very low carb diet, yeah. Um, and uh, I, I lost about eighty, no, seventy pounds doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah, seventy pounds in six months. But I plateaued. I got to the point where uh, in in uh, one week span, I gained like ten pounds. I was eating the same stuff that I was eating for the last six months. Yeah. And uh, so, and on, on top of that, eating meat three times a day, every day for six months, I was tired of it. I'm like, just yeah. take take the. I, I said, take the bacon away. You know, <laughs> I was like, I love bacon. Wow, I love bacon. I really do. But when I'm eating it every morning, and I'm eating, you know, like chicken breast every, you know, uh, lunch, and having like, you know, a steak or uh, like I would have like, you know, a double cheeseburger without the bun and stuff like that, and you know, just w whatever, you know, just eating a lot of different meals. Um, and I would mix it up as well to have like, you know, more fancier stuff and whatnot, but. Uh, I decided to go uh, vegetarian, borderline vegan. Like I, I cut out dairy, and I, uh, um, I, uh, I, I ate a lot of veggies. I like I, I, I started making my own hummus. I started uh, eating a lot of quinoa. Uh, I started discovering that I love like Middle Eastern food, and I loved uh, some uh, Puerto Rican food like plantains. I love plantains. Plantains. Yeah. Aren't those the ones that are kind of like bananas? Yes. Okay. But they're they're like a banana, but they taste kind of like a sweet potato. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. I have had them before. N now I just kind of eat healthy. I uh, I'll have meat from time to time, but it's not the majority of my diet. I I'll have a like, creamer in my coffee, but I don't. That's that's pretty much the dairy that I get. And sometimes I just put almond milk, or I'll drink it black still. Yeah, giving yeah. up dairy, I feel like is the. It's like I know I should give up dairy the way I should know I quit. I should quit smoking. It's like yeah. right there because I, just people who give up dairy, they're like. Oh, you know, I had this recurring problem. I thought it's just the way life was. Like, I thought I'm just supposed to get tons of bumps on my shoulder or something. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> like you know, I give up dairy, and it's like, oh, this is like what I've always dreamed of or something like that. I like, would say it was one of the biggest. I, I, I gave up dairy from, like, um, or was doing very, very little dairy from, like, March through May, and it was, like, some of the best shape I had, I had been in in my life. It really, like, just took care of the last little bit that I... 
I just can't do it because I love the ice cream so much. I see, I rarely ever have ice cream. It's like maybe once every six months, if really? that. I rarely ever have, and I rarely ever have cheese either. I had cheese for lunch today. I had, but normally I, d- I don't have cheese on I the love I eat cheese. anymore either. Though it does taste very good. Love Though I do cheese. have bacon a, a, a lot lately as of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, no, I then I gave up. Uh, well, I'm from the Midwest. I'm gonna say pop. I gave up pop. <laughs> yeah, know. yeah. And uh, I still don't drink that crap anymore. Um, high fructose corn syrup and pretty much anything with pre-processed sugars in it. Like I don't, I don't have snacks. I just don't eat potato chips. I don't eat um, uh, like candy bars or you know anything that's pre-processed or anything like that. Do you I do, try do to real eat sugar, it. like cane sugar? If I am going to use real sugar, then yes. Um, but even then, I don't like to add sugar to anything. That I, I'll get sugar from the fruits and vegetables that I eat. I, I don't want to add any sugar unless it's you know unless it's like my cheat meal, then I will. But otherwise, I'm not going to add sugars at you all. You ever tried that coconut palm sugar? It's no. A, I think Dr. Oz was peddling it or something. It's supposed to be like a lot better than the regular stuff. I, if I want to eat something sweet, my um, I want I, I like I like uh, smoking up and eating some uh, dates. I love dates. Yeah, that's, that's my sweet. Kind of that's my sweet snack. My uh, um, that you know my uh, my indulgence. Yeah, Brett um, makes really good. Um, I don't know. There has to be a word for it, but where you put uh, blue cheese inside the date and then wrap it in bacon and put it in the oven. <laughs> what was the um? Did you guys? What was the place at Pork Fest that? Uh, um, it was a great like southern barbecue place. It was uh, in Agora Valley, and they had uh, I think there was like a prune that they or something Can like that that they wrapped it? around with with bacon. I didn't have that one, but I did. I did have the barbecue. Okay, good. they they did the same thing where it was like a prune. They like injected it with like um, a cherry sauce or something like that, and then they wrapped it with bacon, and it was like. It's still to this day like the greatest thing I've ever had in my life as a food. And I can't wait to go. Well, yeah, the greatest thing I ever had. I can't wait. That I hope that they're there next year. My only <laughs> problem with that is that it's like so sweet and rich that I need a little bit more of like blue cheese or like something to calm it down. Offset it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Hmm. There's lots of ways to have very delicious food without you know eating things that are processed. I'm going. I'm on. I'm working on inventing. An ice cream substitute. A substitute oh. to ice cream. Yes, with so all natural, like primal paleo ingredients. Well, that could sell well. So, yeah. I was saying I can't give up dairy because I'm such an ice cream fiend. And when I say that, it's because like I've been eating ice cream since I was very small. Like I can't remember a time when I wasn't just constantly eating ice cream as a kid. Like I used to be a little heavier. But I feel like I still eat about the same amount of ice. No, there's no way I eat it as much. Because I, I remember my mom. You were eating ice cream more at one point? Yeah. Like, I remember my mom me- How buying. How much ice cream do you eat? A half gallon of ice cream, like, every few days or something oh, like that. Jesus. Like, just, like, can't I couldn't stop. I was, like, a fiend. Just, like, bowl after bowl. Like, I couldn't just have <laughs> one bowl of ice cream. <laughs> and so, um, and I used to love, you know, used to love to put, like, the magic shell on there. Or like yeah. chocolate syrup or something. Anything. Reese's magic show. Yeah, yeah, yeah I used yeah. to love that. Yeah. When I was a fatty. Yeah. So um, I'm just saying that for some context about how much I love ice cream. I'm very picky about it. Um, Would and you say you're an ice cream connoisseur? Probably. But then like my favorite, like really my favorite kind of ice cream is like, is like, um, you know, like some cheapo brand just like plain chocolate. I don't know why, but it just says, can have like the best texture for some reason. I don't like it when they like try to be fancy with the textures, you know, and it really just tastes more like icy or weird or chunkier. But And I need chunky. And it can only be chunky if the chunks are chocolate or like some kind of chocolate thing in there. Yeah. But Brett made this paleo scream stuff. Primal scream. Prim- sorry, primal, primal scream. <laughs> and nice. he originally, before this, came out he had experiments <laughs> with using nuts nut scream <laughs> to make, yeah we called it nut scream and i remember him going like i remember when he like let me try it i don't even think we we're dating at the time but like you would like whip some up yeah and we were all trying it and i was like wait till you try <laughs> this yeah, really and it was like all nuts. icy and chunky yeah <laughs> like, and it totally not icy and chunky the- and it was terrible the only thing it had in common with ice cream is that I had taken it out of the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so when he tried this primal scream stuff, I was not excited. Oh, sorry. Did I say it wrong again? 
um primal screen primal screen yeah, yeah. i was not excited to try it because i thought it was going to be like that scream again but it actually <laughs> is really good yeah it's like mm, de- it's delicious it's like thicker like more creamy than ice cream almost you know how ice cream kind of melts and just turns into like really sweet milk in your mouth yeah this doesn't really do that it kind of stays in the initial s- stages of ice cream that texture the whole time it's almost like somebody put a little delicious cake frosting in it or something yeah. i don't know mm, it's kind of like that here's another one for those low carb people who might because there's a lot of them around here yes now this is not super see, healthy I'm also very like um uh outside of the norm when i say it. like i i eat a mostly vegetarian diet still i'll have meat but it's mostly vegetarian i'm, not like, I know I'm around all these paleo people they're looking at me like <laughs> what are you doing having like you know all these carbs but go, go ahead so say you're hanging out with Allie, right and she's you know just shoveling ice cream in and like <laughs> oh i love ice cream look at me eat ice cream and you say i want that makes that gives me a craving but i'm low carb so what can i do so if you do get a Jones for something sweet like that, and maybe you grew up going to Dairy Queen, you know, where they've got the, sh- and the magic shell, right? So we can have you all these things. Are you about to give away your secrets? I'm going to give away, this is not, I, I didn't invent, I can't take credit for this, but you can have all of that in a fairly low carb form. There's an ice cream called Briar's Carb Smart. They've improved it. It is delicious. It's as good as regular Briar's ice cream. Comes in vanilla, you get that. You buy Baker's chocolate which is 100% cacao, it has no no sugar in it, right? So you can't eat it by itself. You buy a sweetener, the only two that I would recommend are stevia and xylitol. All the other artificial sweeteners, uh, I wouldn't use any of them. You take two squares of the baker's chocolate, you put it in just a microwave safe cup with either about a tablespoon of coconut oil or a tablespoon of butter, Kerrygold I would use. About in, a, in about a minute, it melts. You have to stir it, right? You maybe add four or five squirts of liquid xylitol. Well, to taste as much as you want, or or you know. Doesn't xylitol sound terrible for you? Yeah. It doesn't oh, sound like food. It doesn't sound. Xylitol. No, yeah, yeah. Erythritol, xylitol, and stevia. I, it's, erythritol, I think, is it's okay like a too. Fine print of the ingredients in like a soft <laughs> drink or something yeah. like that. R- r- right, but it's actually it's it's one of the s- best natural sweeteners to use. So, and anything that it's, because it ends in all, which just means it's a kind of I just feel like, alcohol. and I'm not saying that you're one of these people saying this, but a lot of health conscious people, would you have that in common with them? Are all like, if you don't recognize, if you can't pronounce this ingredient on the, on the <laughs> packaging of what you're eating, then you should really double think it. You know, it's like, um, that would limit me so much. Like I could never really eat anything that's convenient. If I always demanded to see every chemical in it and yeah. i have to be able to pronounce and yeah if i have to pronounce it yeah how many times have i been in a restaurant and said i'll have the quesadillas and everyone laughs and then i can't get it because i said it wrong um i'm just saying that xylitol or is that how i say it xylitol yeah it just sounds scary it sounds like one of those things that these health conscious people would like be like ew and put it back well, oh, some of them do some uh, paleo people won't eat any sweeteners because they're not purely natural so big finish with our ice cream story here once this melts into a hot chocolatey sauce you and you sweeten it and you taste it to make sure it's sweet enough for you you pour that shit on that ice cream right and you put it in the freezer you come back a minute later magic shell wow whoa that's uh that sounds amazing i'll have to try it now if you want more variety like i do take some almond butter and just kind of spoon a little of that in there too now i do this almost every night and then you put the coconut flakes on. Sometimes I'll sprinkle some coconut flakes on there, too. For, uh, I want to say pizzazz, but I stuttered. Yeah, that's a, just a, a textural enhancement. So is this going to be like recipes that you put on your your new show as well? Tell, tell yeah, we would talk them. about this. Kale chips. People should be eating kale chips, I think. Um, yeah, I've cooked uh, kale chips I've, Yeah, I've made those before. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah I did that for uh, a while when I was doing Atkins, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That that's really good. Um, but yeah, you should do that. Do the do do a new show, man. You gotta. I mean, do you still have a passion for school sucks? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it, you know, it, it ebbs and flows a little bit. Like sometimes it's hard to figure out the next thing to do. I've been doing a lot of video work uh, because um, I'm really I'm, I really like that process. It's like um, it's so much more exciting than audio. I mean, audio. Before I knew how to do, I remember before I knew any of this stuff, I would like write, and I'd be like, I'm a writer. And then as soon as I discovered podcasting, I was like, writing is so stupid. 
And I understand some people are really good at it. Some people really enjoy it and it's fine. But writing was just so stupid for me because I was better at this other medium. And then when I started like figuring out how to use like, you know, Sony Vegas and, and do, um, you know, editing, um, you know, having a monologue and making it work with video and music, I was like, podcasting is boring to me now. But I mean, I still do the podcast and I still like doing the podcast and I'm happy when, you know, I'm uh, with the finished product of the podcast, but I love video stuff. I, I'm I'm trying to teach myself how to use PowerDirector right now as it is, um, but uh, I, I'm still a podcast junkie. Like, I still listen to a lot of podcasts, though I'll be honest, I don't listen to that much Liberty Media anymore. Good. I used to listen. I mean, I, I'm saying this <laughs> as I make a Liberty-oriented show, but since I moved here, I feel like I'm living the life, so, like, the Liberty life, whatever you want to yeah. call yeah, yeah. it, you know? So it's like I don't... I don't need to listen to Free Talk Live anymore. I don't need to listen to like any, you know, a lot of that. That for most part, any, any like Liberty Media that's made here is really more for people out there. You know, yeah. like I, I, I view any Liberty oriented show, podcast, YouTube channel, you name it. That's more so activism to inspire people to come here, or it's uh, just telling you know, it's just in general because I don't need. I don't need to know. I don't need to be reminded and told what it is because I'm here. Yeah. It, I mean, I, that's not uncommon because if you ask, I had the same experience. If you ask uh, Mark, I know he said it a bunch of times, like, you know, we really want people to come here, but we do notice that when people come, they stop listening to our show. So <laughs> are we really working against ourselves? But, uh, but yeah, that's just, I think, and that's a weird thing because I remember hearing about this before I moved that you just don't, like, you're not listening to the same shows anymore after you move. That, that just seems crazy. Like, it seems like you'd want to listen more. But my experience is you feel like almost like, oh, I'd be really doing my friend a favor by listening. But then you have some shows that you just can't stop listening to. What shows do you guys still listen to? Well, I can't stop listening to, like, I watch free domain radio videos, like, all the time. And it's you're become still, a thing. You're still on the mound. No, what's weird is that cult? What's weird is that I uh, was never like so into Stepan Molyneux that I would like ever quote him or bring him up in a conversation. So I've never really been like a, the biggest fan because there's always been little things that I thought he said that were very strange. But I have been like more of a fan in the past. But now I just listen so that I can like hate him. A what is he bit. gonna do next? Like, what is he gonna say about women <laughs> I mean, it's a next? a wreck. Like, from what I've just seen, like, it's it's. I'm I'm waiting for him to go like way into the. I have the, uh, I have this weird thing back. where like he'll be saying something, I'll be like, yeah, you know, actually, yeah, I think that what he's saying, he's really on onto something. But then he he takes it and, and like to, to the extent that I agree with him, I appreciate that he's one of the only people that have the balls to like call women out on some bullshit they do. But then. He takes it so far that it's like, I could never, like, like I start to feel guilty that I was starting to, like, believe in what he was saying for a second. I'm like, wow, I can't, I can't win with this guy. He won't, he just, like, ruins it at the end. It's become, and and don't get me wrong, I still like Steph. And I still, I actually, for, for the work that Steph has done since 2005, he definitely has my respect as a fellow podcaster. I still send him money every month. It's an automatic, I don't like, oh, time to send Stefan Molyneux money. It's automatically taken out of my account. Maybe if I had to write him a check every month, I would forget sometimes. But for the work that he did between 2005 and 2012, um, that was very influential for me. And he really, you know, clarified a lot of things. So people are really just kind of discovering him since he's been on this, since he's moved into men's rights. I don't want to call it a kick because I even think there's like, I even think there's a lot of validity to what he's doing with that, but it's getting to me like sometimes it feels like a little Alex Jonesy, like oh yeah, well, he is a normal guest now on Alex Jones. Yeah, but yeah. the same, but even Alex Jones said it because I'll listen to Alex Jones and I'll be like, yeah, Alex, that's yeah, that's a good point, and then he'll just say something and you'll be like, what the fuck, huh? <laughs> Why would you say that? I was getting ready to share this video with like normal people, like yeah. my mother. You know, and then you say this crazy thing, um, and now I can't share it unless I'm going to, you know, download it and edit that crazy shit out. So, uh, yeah, you you seem to have kind of a, a reaction to the to the Steph thing, for both me, of you guys. For me, I um, for Stefan, 
uh, I think everything he's done in regards to like what liberty is like, mm-hmm. for me, like the story of your enslavement was a huge like. I yeah, got it's check. iconic. Yeah, yeah, it's like, like yeah. Well, so many people have seen it. Like that, that's really helped me a lot, and um, the, a lot of other stuff. Whenever he's talking about the state, he, he's oh, I I'm a hundred and ten percent on board. Mm-hmm. When he goes into more social issues, like talking about how people who have tattoos are abused, like they're, they're abuse people, and then. The, going on against people who like MMA and stuff like that. And yeah. A bunch of other it's like social issues. I think he's going into the weeds, and I, I really disagree with him. And then he has come across as somewhat cultish, um, especially in regards to, like, he freaks out when someone sends him a $2 donation. Yeah. Um, and, uh, like, he should never have released that. I mean, even if I understand why he's saying that, because, like, he feels like his – his worth is more than two dollars to someone for the amount of time and energy he's putting in doing a show, but you don't scream at your audience. About, oh my god, like, no! A, a donation. You know how many like like people are always out there thinking that every business they go to, it's like they go and spend six dollars in a store. I just gave that store six dollars of my money. It's like no, you didn't, dude. Like your stuff cost like five ninety nine. Or sometimes your stuff costs $6 and the store took a loss on you because they hoped you would buy something that made them money. So, like, if other people took this kind of mentality about, like, shouldn't I be worth it? Then most, you know, businesses are running on a very low profit margin. That's just normal. And, like, it's suicide to complain about like individual especially customers. especially when he's he is literally bitcoin balling like his wallet's like huge i mean it's, yeah they published a you think he'd embrace micropayments <laughs> well yeah, here's the thing okay he's a very thick libertarian for sure mm-hmm. right and the reason why i think he's become become that because if you go back and you listen to like and i'm not saying anyone has to do this but you know listen to the first 500 episodes right it's non-aggression principle property rights and you start you start to see him dabbling when he realizes how much he has to say he starts dabbling into these other areas he starts talking about the family he starts talking about childhood so the guy's done over 3000 shows the guy's talked maybe more like into microphone into recordings on the internet maybe i can't think of anyone who's done it more in the world you know like obviously you're going to broaden you know like you, there's only so much you can say about Rothbard and Mises and Hayek and and Ayn Rand. Even if you want to spread out to like Ayn Rand, I'm not I'm not dissing all of his. Again, his, when he's talking about all of that, <clears throat> right? I'm, I'm all on board. Um, he's like a prude, do you think? Kind of. He comes across as if he's the greatest gift of humanity, as if like he is. I think he thinks that. I think he thinks that too, and uh, it's not. I think a, he find it very annoying that we would question. That that's true. Yeah. Or that we would be complaining they thinks that. He'd no, be like, excuse me. Don't, don't get me wrong. I do think there is, like, I try to be as confident as I can in my life, no matter what sure. I'm doing. Yeah. All right? Now, there is a line between, you know, there, there's a line of, you know, confidence and arrogance. I like to think I'm walking up to that line as close as possible. He's like, you know, 100 miles past that line at this point. Well, he deserves to be arrogant. I think that... The most annoying thing is someone who's confident about what they have to say, but they don't know what the fuck they're saying. <laughs> um, it's very popular, actually. And, yeah. And, like, you know, someone who's arrogant but doesn't have a reason to be. Like, they haven't really, like, done anything that's it's like worthy compensation. or something. Yeah. But it's not really arrogance to me, I guess, if you've, like, done. So my point is, like, I think the way he would describe himself as the gift to humanity is based on the peaceful parenting stuff. And in that way, it's like if what you've done has really like kicked off peaceful parenting and like not hitting your kids and shit like that, then yeah, you are kind of like one of the biggest gifts to humanity. You're a gift. You're one of the gifts. Definitely a gift. But I mean, that's, it's like huge. And it wasn't even obvious to a lot of libertarians who are really good at finding non-obvious stuff that's like lurking behind the scenes and well, step really on molyneux clean water things. electricity i mean, <laughs> well, I mean <laughs> that was the, that was a creation of a lot of people yeah you know? yeah yeah, I yeah. Think a lot of people have sort of come to this conclusion over time he's not the first person to come up with don't hit your kids but to get it out there to the extent that he has and like have followers who are willing to like preach this shit to mothers who hit their kids in grocery stores like it's kind of useful well i mean peaceful parenting I, I, that's not a big issue that i definitely agree with him on but the nail in the coffin for me was when he was using um 
copyright law to take down other YouTubers. Uh, yeah, like using that's, that's the that's arm undependable. of the state, literally using the state against another person doing free speech. And I need to, I still, we, talk, we talked about this on my show. We actually talked about this with Thaddeus Russell, who hates Stefan Molyneux, but defended him on all these things that are not about his philosophy, right? But he didn't then there's defend a, it. He just said he didn't def necessarily defend it, but he's like, I don't care about that shit. Right, exactly. Right, well, he defended him against like what he perceived as ad hominem attacks. And there's a valid question, right? Like if Steph preaches one thing but then does another, that's a huge problem. And I've almost like wanted to just like write to them and be like, hey, you, you know. But th I mean, there's Steph knows marketing. He's smart, right? So he's not saying anything about it for a reason, right? But now there's this lawsuit. So what's going to happen? Is this going to be the downfall of Free Domain Radio? I, I don't know. But like, if there's more of a story there, like people who kind of support him and you know put some faith in him as a you know as a as a person and as well as a personality, um, I, I think there should be some answer for this, and it shouldn't just be like dismissed. Like, oh, you know, some people are just talking about how I you know violate uh, or you use copyright laws against people, and they should be focusing on these things. Well, no, this is kind of this is kind of important, you know. Well, well I mean, like Stefan literally is the he's the giant. You know, he, he what did he get like a million downloads or something like that on his podcast. It's I don't know what hard his to download. say. It's it's, a, it's an insane amount of numbers of uh, listeners that he has. So I mean. He's huge. He's not like uh, you know a lot of podcasters. They're they're happy if they can get ten thousand listeners. You know, yes. He, he's at he has to be a couple hundred thousand, if not a million. Like I don't know what his numbers are, but it's it's has to be really high, right? I mean, I don't know what he's it's, a lot higher than me. It's like another league. Uh, it's like there's him. He's in a league of his own. I mean, there's yeah. no one else even next to him. As far as like libertarian content. Libertarian. Like, yeah. The only one probably close is maybe Joe Rogan. But even then, like he's not libertarian. I mean, he's, he says he's libertarian, but like. He's not. He doesn't count. But I mean, that's probably the only person even that like, has close numbers to what he does. And I would think Rogan gets more per episode than Steph. Probably does. But I mean, Stefan is a philosophy show and he, his numbers are huge, though. You know, Joe Rogan obviously isn't a philosophy show. Yeah. So, right, right. So, I mean, Steph is up here, and then there's a bunch of us, like, you know, Free Talk Live and, and my show, and I don't even know what else would it be. Rebel Love Show. Do you guys, do you guys consider yourself a libertarian show? Yeah, I consider it a liberty-oriented show. Liberty-oriented show. I mean, it's in the liberty community. Um, I, I, all of our guests are liberty people. But yeah. it's not a philosophy show, per se. I mean, it's not like an educational show or anything like that. It's more of a – think of it as – I don't really know what – to be honest, I used to pitch it as, like, the Joe Rogan experience means the Free State Project. Now I don't even really do that anymore. Um, it's more so just trying to highlight what people are like here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's kind of, like, the goal of it for right now. I have a mind how I want the show to evolve later on. Um, but that's kind of like the stage. This is season one so to speak so nice that's what we're at right I, now i think we're the first show that's really showing the culture of manchester and like talking about what's going on here i mean sure that we do that every show we talk about actually like what's going on in this city and before i moved to new hampshire i had no idea what was happening in manchester you know i just listened to all the the audio out of Keene, and that was it yeah so it's giving a different perspective of what the fsp is like from another city uh, besides media out of keen um again very niche i understand that it's a very niche thing that but it's good to, i'm trying to be good yeah, I yeah. if it is or not I, well, I, in my mind it's i think not. this show is pretty good right i think now. this show is good but i, I also think, think niche is good to yeah. have a niche yeah yeah uh, the, there's definitely no one doing something similar to this at the moment the only thing that's even close to this is i would that is in new hampshire would be black sheep rising but he Conan has his own style. Like we have yeah. a completely different style. Than that's what totally he has. different. Yeah. yeah, but that's the only thing even closely in the same genre. I see. Yeah. As what we do. Well, yeah, the fact that it's like showing personalities in Manchester because that is kind of what Manchester is missing, is that and I mean I don't know if you guys know this but they oh you, of course you do because you listen to Free Talk Live but they always like. 
Like Ian likes to like jab Manchester yep. for not yep. doing this kind of thing. You know, like oh. I guess they're doing stuff in Manchester. We'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah. No, he's uh, I, I know he likes what we do. I don't know. Hopefully, he does. I don't know, but. Uh, don't wait for his approval. Oh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> well, you know, he gave me blog access to free to free Keen, so I, I put every episode oh, wow. up on free Keen. That's so. an honor. Yeah, I know. It, it was an honor. He approached me at uh he approached me at Area twenty three during Liberty Forum before I even brought the show like on because we, we I was originally doing it as a webcast before I moved here and then I, I, I put on hiatus for like a month before I, I got back here. But like he approached me to blog for before I even like brought like got this apartment. So, like, and then as soon as I started to show up, I'm like, oh, I have access to the site that gets a hell of a lot of hits. That's great. Yeah. I'm going to throw my show up on there. Yeah. yeah. He is not setting a word to me to stop me. So, uh, <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah. that was definitely an honor when he approached me. Yeah. For I'm, sure. I'm getting set up on, on Free Keen, too. He really? wants me, yeah. He wants I me did to not put know up, that. You didn't know? Okay. He wants me to put on um, the new show, It's Like This, too, that I'm doing with Cecilia. Um, we're putting that out on the Free State Project uh, YouTube account, but he wants it on Free Keen as well. Nice. And I, I might, you know, dabble and, and blog a little bit. I don't know. He just needs to, Ian. You just need to put us on uh, on LRN. Yeah. Because you said you would. I'm gonna hold you to that. How long have you been doing the show? We have been doing the show um, regularly since the beginning of April. Yeah, it took us all. Yeah, then you should you should ask. He, he usually he wants. Oh no, no, he's already approached us. He he got the, he has the RSS feed. Ah, he's just waiting to update. It's in his the back site. pocket. Yeah, he has it. I'm just I'm just waiting from the the <laughs> like to check the site and then the podcast loop. That's all I'm waiting for at the moment. Yeah, so exciting stuff. It is exciting. I'm just waiting for that to actually happen. I don't know. Um, we'll we'll see when that happens. Not, but. At any rate, we need we're going way over what we normally oh, yeah. record. So oh really? Yeah, we only usually do an hour, so we're already at like an hour and fifteen minutes as it is. Oh, okay. So we usually only do an hour, unless you yeah. So uh, unless you want to keep going, I do don't you want to do like another bonus content? Fifteen twenty? Sure. Yeah, I would well, do that. What would you like do to they talk want about? To? <laughs> yeah. Wait, do you guys? I'm, want? I'm down. I'm sure. down. Go yeah. ahead. What, what what's on your mind? What do you want to bring up? Oh, I don't know. I like more reacting to things and initially like th th this is what I okay. like about being on other people's I, shows. I was wa kind of wanting this to come up. Why are we talking about it? Um, oh gosh. I, it related to something we were talking about. Um, okay. I'll just be out. Oh, we were talking about like, you know, Stefan Molyneux. Wow. That guy has some great things to say. I have some good memories of being enlightened by things that he said. And now there's these accusations and, pr and like proof that he, use the state, which he's su supposedly all against, in order to, you know, bring someone down who was acting voluntarily and not using any violence whatsoever. So, you know, does that mean that it's okay that we still appreciate him for the other things? Related to Bill Cosby, Whoa. turns out to be a serial <laughs> rapist. Does that mean I can't wear fancy sweaters Too anymore? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> or they're not called oh, Cosby sweaters. Table? No, no, that's not, that's not. Cosby's that's not, off the table. No, Bill, Bill Cosby's always on. I just learned about this like 30 minutes before the show about Cosby. I was like, what the hell is this? We read all about it. Well, well do tell because all I know is that he's accused of rape. So well, I don't, I don't know. I guess we don't necessarily know it's true. But I feel I'm starting to think I'm just getting my I'm just I don't want to be one of those people who's like, no, those you know how people just make claims. And then it turns out to be real. I just, I'd rather be in a position where I assume it's real. And then if it turns out not to be real, then I'm relieved. But let's just assume for a second that it's possible that Bill Cosby is like a serial rapist, like drugs women has like for how many years? Since nine, the 60s. Really? That's going to ruin like jello pudding for me. Jello and pudding, every yeah. time Fat I Albert. It, I'm going to think of serial rape. Theo Huxtable. Oh. All He's down in flames. Obstacles. I love them. Now, is it a, isn't it still okay for us to like be fans? Hmm. I haven't watched the Cosby Show since I was a kid. I haven't seen any of the stand-up since I was like. They were 10, about 12. to launch a new sitcom where he was like the patriarch of some multi-generational family. Netflix. Really? I think it was a Netflix original series. They pulled it. Ooh. He had. Um, yeah, no, they, they, he was going to do comedy stand-up specials on Netflix. I mean, he's 77. Um, and then th there was going to be a network show, like a new Bill Cosby show, and they shelved it. 
because of uh, this. And there's no there's no criminal proceedings. I think probably the statute of limitations is beyond. Uh, the the most recent uh, accusation was like mid '80s. You know, it made me think. I mean, I'm nowhere near anything that Bill Cosby ever did. But if my show blows up and I'm supposed to be like this. You know, I don't want to call myself like a moral philosopher or anything, but like somebody who's trying to be taken seriously and somebody and these things start to surface like I went out with, on a date with him in 1996 and he was very mean to me. <laughs> you know, he was not a very nice guy. Is that well, the I worst mean, thing we're going to find out about you? Worst thing you'd find out about me. Um, uh, oh, I thought of the worst the worst thing that I can think of that oh, I ever did. You, just out yourself now and you'll be absolved. Yeah. You're on the Rebel Love Show. Um, I broke a door once. Um, <laughs> it, it, well, this is... Are you, you look horrified. Are you... No. It was probably 1996 and I was at a party and... Um, let's see. It was around then. 96, 97. I was like a sophomore, junior... Just sophomore in college. And uh, this girl, I was really drunk. Like we were, it was in the middle of like a, a big, you know, bender at school. It might've been around Christmas. So it was freezing cold, it was winter. I can't believe I'm telling this story, but now I feel like it has a momentum that I can't stop it. <laughs> um, so this girl that I was kind of involved with, she's like, I want you to come back to my house tonight. And I was like, oh yeah, sure, let's do that. Uh, I like how Brett can't say having sex with you. <laughs> You've kind of involved with. Kind of involved with. Kind of involved no, I don't think we had ever had. I think maybe that was part of the excitement. Like oh, we were yeah. kind of like starting to, you know, like examine the you possibilities. Guys really all the way involved yet. No, we were examining the possibilities of fucking. Did you examine it? <laughs> so, so anyway, um, she says she comes up to me at this party, and I'm wasted, and she says. I want you to come back to my house tonight. I'm like, yeah. So I called a cab to take me to her house, right? But she meant like after the party, but I had no concept of time. So she says this to me at apparently like, I don't know, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. She's thinking like one, two o'clock in the morning. So I get in a cab. I'm very, oh, this is in Vermont. I'm very, you know, uh, not appropriately dressed for, for the elements there. Uh, and I get to her house and I'm locked out, right? And she lives in a, a, a building almost exactly like this, right? Where if you get in the door, then it's just like, you know, kind of a, a door that gets you into the apartment. Now, I introduced this story as saying I broke a door. This was the worst thing that I ever did. Um, so I get there and I'm like, oh, I'm locked out. But then I thought about the dorms at the college where I lived. And we could just kind of like elbow them and the, they would pop open. And I was like, she won't mind if I just pop in, you know, and, and wait for her. But I'm almost like blackout drunk. Like I barely remember any of this. So I do it, right? And I give the, the door a little push, right? And it opens. I'm like, great. So I go in and I sit on the couch for, I don't know, and I'm probably in and out of consciousness for probably hours. And at some point I say, I'm hungry. I'd like some food. So I went and I started cooking myself like food. And then uh, I was drinking, uh, so like I had helped myself to like a bottle of liquor and, um, I'm thinking this will be great. She'll be home soon. She'll be so happy to see me. So, um, eventually she comes home and there I am with food on my face and a bottle of liquor. And I hadn't noticed this, but the door, when I had popped it open, the reason why it opened so nice and easy was that the door frame had broken apart all over the floor in her living room. So this is what she walked in, walked into. That's uh, that's the worst thing I can think of that I was ever involved in. Oh no! Look at your look. Are you? I was so young. I've heard you told me the story like three times. I, oh, okay, okay, <laughs> that's good. I was just a boy. I no, was I was in fascination by the way you told the story, and you're like, and so I popped the door, and it opened. I'm like, no, it didn't. It fucking broke. <laughs> but I understand for the purpose of the story. Yeah, drunk Brett yeah. was like, I just popped it open. That was my name in college. Drunk, drunk Brett. Brett. Yeah. Drunk Brett. Because of because of stories like that. Wow. What other what other drunk stories do you have? Wow. <laughs> Doesn't that open a? You're the one that wants to stay on the show. Barrel of snakes. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh gosh, I feel like there's I don't, I don't know. It's not, uh, one time I was um I accidentally um I feel like all these stories involve college and girls. 
and drinking way too much. That sounds like well, college. I feel like yeah. now we should all tell a drunk story. Yeah, like, I'm try- I was trying to think of my best one. Yeah. Oh, don't ask me first. I don't know. I, I, I got a few, but oh, man. I'm trying to think of a good one. That's a tough one because I, I have a bunch of them too, definitely. Like, yeah, I, I one time I was drunk and on the phone with my best friend, and I was like, Hey, man, I'm looking for my car. Like, I'm not going to drive it. I'm just going to lay in the back for a while and, like, chill out. And I'm like, where am I? And so I'm talking to him. He's like, wait, what? What? Where are you? I'm like, yeah, I'm somewhere in Long Beach right now, and I have no idea. And I'm just talking to him, like, and I'm like, la-di-da. And uh, luckily, I, a friend of mine is going to the party that I just left, and he's walking across the street, you know, towards me. And, and so he, he picked me up, and I ended up going back to the party. But... That's that's a pretty good one. Just getting completely lost, talking you know on the phone with my best friend and freaking him out. That's a pretty good one. What about you, Allie? Do you have any drunk stories? Um, I remember in high school getting really drunk with my friends, just like in like drinking amounts that like I can't imagine. I just <laughs> like today. I just think I don't. I just can't imagine myself ever drinking that much ever again in my life and it being appropriate. But I just remember. You guys remember those MD20 drinks? MD2020s? Yeah. Mad, Mad Dogs. dogs. Yeah. We used to get those. Why did, I don't know why we went for those, but we would get them and we would, every girl would like have her own. And like, I remember finishing mine off, my friend being like, yeah, it's gross after like a couple sips and me finishing hers off. And like, and like, I was also a speed drinker. Like, like I was a show off about it too. So it was just awful. So <laughs> after one of these nights, sometimes it would, work out well for me but most of the time not one I remember we had like we binge drank before the night before senior year orientation like you know when it's like you go in the first day and it's you're not going to class you're just like learning about who you're gonna have you like go and sit in each classroom with who your classmates are gonna be I went to that and I was like still I think now I'm starting to experience hangovers but back then, it wasn't like you hang, you wake up and you're detoxifying and your head hurts. This was like, I was still drunk, like felt exactly the same as when I went to bed. So I went to see senior orientation, totally wasted. Like, <laughs> and like tried to play it off. Like I was like, I'm ready. And like, I, I tried to act like nothing was wrong. And I was just like, fuck this year, I don't even care. I don't know why I didn't just drop out at that point, but I was like, <laughs> I was like, a year's not that long, you know, I can, how long, how many months do you stay in school? Like, nine? Yeah. Yeah. I was like, it'll be fine. I'll just not give a shit this last year. And it was like one of the worst years, like senior year is the worst. I remember my, uh... I'm, now, there's a lot of pressure on you, okay, because these stories have no innocent bystanders. They have no property damage, mm-hmm. right? So, what do you got? I don't have one with property damage. I, um... I remember the first time that I really got drunk at a party where, like, I, I, I didn't know my limit. I remember I passed out and somehow ended up uh, on the other side of the, uh, like, I think it was in the kitchen. Yeah, I was in the kitchen clenching a pillow that I had vomited on for some <laughs> no. reason. This is like, when I was, I think it was 20 or something like that. I didn't know hold my liquor. Um, and then, um, I like six years ago, six or seven years ago, yes, no, six, no, seven years ago, uh, I went to a conference for work in, uh, in Vegas and me and, uh, me and my roommate at the time, my coworker, we like, we, it was our first time in Vegas. So we're like, we gotta go hit the strip and, you know, cause in Vegas you can walk around with a drink, like everyone's walking around with drinks and stuff like that. And somehow we ran into um and then like uh, a couple other co-workers joined and we, all four of us we were just wasted and somehow we're on the opposite side of the strip and uh i remember um getting kicked out of uh another hotel because we were like hugely just not screaming but like basically being hugely rude at a blackjack table and like being, you know, being like, <laughs> like pulled by our arms by like security, you know, oh, no. getting, <laughs> being pulled out of a, uh, I, I forgot the name of the hotel. Um, it wasn't Mandalay Bay because that's where I was staying at. It was because that's at the end of the strip. I forgot the one, which one it was. Uh, and uh, somehow, 
somehow I don't remember making it back to my hotel room, but somehow I made it back. And then somehow, I, remember, I mean, somehow, I don't I can remember. Relate to that I honestly, it's like... a blackout. I remember being, <laughs> I remember being removed from the blackjack table, and then I don't remember. I remember waking up drunk and going to the conference drunk still because I was still drunk, and it was all, this. That was only with like a couple hours sleep, probably. Because I remember it being like probably three or four in the morning. Yeah. The worst thing about alcohol is how it makes you feel so like important to everyone else. <laughs> oh yeah, you feel you feel like you're the top of the world, and you you are the center of attention. You are like the you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like you're gonna like w- when you get really drunk, like in a bar, like in some kind of contained atmosphere, and then like you unleash yourself onto like whatever the next plans are. You're all like. You're like just opening. You're just like an open vessel. Like whatever comes at you, you're like it, it's like that thing where you're overly confident, but you haven't you don't have anything to be confident about. So you just think you can handle all these situations, and you fail, but you don't have the inhibitions to realize that you're fucking up. So you continue that stuff until you. Wake you're up just on the your most important person. Pillow. Yeah, we've all been there. I just I remember like one night just screaming in a bar. They actually know it was a blackout. People told me about it, and I was going, "You're welcome, everybody." You're welcome for peaceful parenting. You're welcome. You're welcome that I came to this planet. Wow. Uh. <laughs> That's not true. That's not a true story. That's a callback to an earlier uh, story, um, <laughs> if anyone's just joining us. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I feel like, you know, by my current system of values, uh, as I'm kind of thinking about uh, all these things that happened in college – coming back to me like they're all like so shameful and embarrassing like they all involve destroying something or have you had some good drunk experiences though oh like, break dancing like, yeah. there's yeah. like a little window where i'm like really like most ba- likable the magic in, hour lasts about the, an hour back in the day um <laughs> like uh, i would say seven years ago remember you guys remember when rock band came out Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh my god! Me and my friends, we used to we used to have like these huge rock band parties where like twenty people come in the house, wow. and we would uh, we'd have like um, instead of like dance offs, it'd be a rock band off, you know, and like it'd be different crews, different bands that would ba- it'd be a battle of the bands type of thing, and everyone would be drunk, and then we were celebrating some I forgot what we were celebrating, but there was decorations up and stuff like that. I, I forgot what it was even for, to be perfectly honest. And uh, I I actually like to sing, so like we were, I was like the singer, and we were, like I had a full band and everything like that. And sometimes we we were hardcore. We had mic stands and stuff like that. So, you know, I remember like singing and playing guitar, and me and uh, my bassist at the time, like we were really into it. We were really drunk, so we were like you know dancing around like while we're playing, like having stage presence. Because rock band, you gotta have stage presence. You just can't like be there just like you know strumming a guitar and doing nothing. You gotta like you know be the rock star because that's the whole point you get drunk and act as if like you're a rock star yeah. you know <laughs> um and i remember at the end of the night like that 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 house was completely totaled because we, <laughs> we act as if like we were rock stars like the whole time like, there's beer bottles everywhere uh chairs turned over and you know stuff destroyed and whatnot like there was a guitar that was shattered because one of us just like shattered the guitar on the ground and um which was my guitar unfortunately oh. um but uh, it was an awesome night. But it, yeah, I used to love rock band. That was that was like my uh, that was my karaoke you, for like two years straight. Do you guys ever get those great drunk ideas? Like when you're drunk and like you just get an amazing idea and you have to write it down for so are you for the next day. Yeah. 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 And then uh, a lot of the time you can't understand your notes. <laughs> I've been there. Uh, most of my drinking was done before I would say I was really had that kind of creative impulse mm. like i'm when you said that like w- were you ever drunk and and you got an idea yeah i remember like one time me and my friend his name was kevorkian i don't know why we called him that but that was his name in college and neither of us had ever been in a fight before so we said we should we should fight maybe <laughs> to see what it's like <laughs> And we didn't know, like, we both just, I think, punched each other as hard as we could. And we both hurt each other pretty significantly, uh, bled, you know. And this was all captured on one of these VHS camcorders that I mentioned earlier. Because wow. someone, so um, it, it was interesting, like, somebody was walking around this party. It was like a party during the day, during this, like, Christmas. Like, we, we'd hang out at college, like, after classes ended, before we went home for, like, Christmas break. So there'd be, like, four days of nothing with just, like the most harsh, harsh partying environment. And um, it was like the morning 
after the night of a huge party and we're having another party and I lived in this house and we didn't have furniture, like only one room. Was, there was no, no, the only rooms that were furnished were our bedrooms. And then like the rest of the house was just empty. And we had like, we heated it with people, you know? So there's like 60 people in there and somebody's walking around this VHS camcorder and then all of a sudden it just kind of pans over to me and this guy and we're in the corner kind of acting very strange and uh it, it kind of like the person comes up and just starts capturing this interaction like have you ever been in a fight no i haven't either you know you don't see what it's like to punch each other <laughs> and then with they the camera person like it like a real journalist you know followed us outside they were learning something about what we were uh, you know communications mass media they followed outside they framed it up beautifully and they captured us punching each other and then, and this where video? is this on YouTube? Yeah. It's not. It was on VHS. See, that's the problem with VHS is like most of that stuff, you know, if you didn't have the foresight to protect it, the all those all the tapes and I'm I'm guessing there's probably an hour of footage that existed at one time of me doing really stupid things. But at this point, I'm guessing that even if you had a VH, uh, VHS that those tapes have deteriorated. Okay. So, your story was so titillating that when the cat jumped on my lap, it like actually scared me That's like, oh my gosh <laughs> in case anyone's listening like why did she just freak out but yeah my my, my uh drinking days are uh far behind me because like i gave that up to like get in shape and lose weight you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, i like to smoke and i do like to uh drink from time to time in a social atmosphere but like i used to be a heavy drinker and i i no longer do that it's like a it's like a past life you know yeah. it's not it's not part of who i am anymore i feel the same way yeah, I can't even believe that, like, the things that I, the memories that I have, I can't even believe that it was me, you know? What's yeah. that movie where you have somebody else's memories? Total Recall? I, no? I feel mm -hmm. like that a lot. I mean, like, for me, like, I went through, I went through a transition, like, with my mind and body, and then I moved here, and it's like, it's been, a, it's like, this is like, was a reset on my life, for just living a different life. Wait until you get super drunk and embarrass yourself. Then it'll be just like the old days. Well, here <laughs> I've already kidding. done. I've done that a couple times here. Oh, unfortunately, I, I I Me was uh, <laughs> I, I was I was intoxicated for much of uh, Pork Fest and did some stupid stuff when I was there. Yes, I. I Why do I always insist on drinking at Pork Fest? It's like the worst time. <laughs> I, I Everyone's had, got a camera and everyone gives a shit. So at the Satoshi Saloon, like uh, Shema Carlos, like, oh, don't worry, you drink for free. <laughs> I'm like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go ahead. There's just go ahead and whatever you want, whatever you want to come in. And I'm like. All right, you know, and I like two nights in a row, like that's all I did. Like this is, I was just no, I would, that was my pit stop. I was, uh, I used to, um, like a, this was my first pork fest because before I came here, I never set foot in this state before I moved. So I'd never been to Liberty Forum, never went to pork fest, never came and visited to see how I might like it, you know. And um, when I went to pork fest, uh, all I did was I called it walking to be. I just kept going tent to tent because I know so many people. And I just kept walking around for like literally the entire week. But that that location was like my home base, my um my pit stop. So I'd always come get a drink, and then like get the like stay there for like an hour, you know. Drink we always like bit. find each other there too, like the game. Oh yeah, that was the that was the if meeting you, spot. That was, that yeah. you meet up, and then you pick someone else to go with, and then you somehow make your rounds. Talk and strategy back. on like what to do with Portland. Yeah, yeah, too. yeah. I, I hope they do that again. By the way. I hope, oh. they, I hope they said that. Yeah, I'm going to get him hooked up with Dogecoin as well for you user, uh, listeners who use Dogecoin. I'm not, well, then I'm, well, A, they don't sell anything there, so they can take Dogecoin as a donation, but they <laughs> weren't selling anything. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 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 So you can try and get them to set it up. With, I don't I'll do it. Though. Yeah. What do you mean they weren't selling anything? They were, um, you had to be there at the right time to actually eat. Uh, and they kind of, well, no, they, I guess they did sell drinks, sort of. A lot of people at Porkfest aren't selling anything. I mean, you can go there and, like, receive gifts. And sometimes you, like, give people money because that's fun at Porkfest. You're talking but about Carla, right? There are a lot of people who... Yeah, Carla Moore. Who have things to offer and they accept donations. Yeah, they're, they're not doing, like, a formal storefront yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. They're not doing any kind of, like, it was legal a transaction. Thing. Yeah, she did the nicest thing. And she didn't. She ra she she took donations for yes. my show. Yes, she did. And that was so nice. And then it was presented to me at the and I that's, couldn't that's even believe it. That's how she sold liquor. With that's right. She was selling liquor as donations. The school sucks. That yeah. was like the sweetest thing. It was so nice. It was like the one of the most touching things. 
It's pretty cool. I like yeah. her. Yeah, yeah, no, she she's definitely incredible. Yeah, yeah. Um, but at any rate, uh, we now we're coming up on two, so let's. Yeah, let's yeah, start. sure, sure. Let's cut out. Is there anything you guys wanna uh, plug while you're here? Uh, schoolsucksproject.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. School sucks podcast is our username. And you should go to the AV Club. Oh yeah! Should if you love the show, it. consider supporting it. And I'm working on alleyhavens.com. The site's under construction, but I'm planning to use that as like sort of like a portfolio page, I think, where I can link to different stuff I've done. It's just the idea, you know. Like, what are you, you going to do now? I don't know. That's sort of like kind of what I want. That's just like my idea, like a landing page for all the for anything I've been on before. Like I would put this on, you know, when it comes out, but. Um, I don't, I don't know how to collect all th these things, you know, like I just, it's just cause like every time I was on free talk live, am I going to post every episode, like go through and find every episode or find the best ones. But anyway, I'm working on that right now and, um, I'm thinking about things I could do next. I like the idea of doing video editing. I think that would be fun. Well, go for it. There's a lot of video that you can edit. So yeah. I know there's a, there's there's a lot of there's more video, video to edit than there's than you can even there is editors yeah. yeah exactly yeah well yeah. also maybe producing videos would be fun yeah and uh, yeah, of course you can find all my uh, content at shiredude.com if you watch the videos at shiredude.com you will have 15 minute long orgasms well first off before <laughs> before the 15 minute orgasms have you guys seen Shire Dude yet? yes yes Okay. We are fans. I forgot to say how much I loved it. it was, I oh, wanted to open the you. show by saying uh, uh, Carlos got us got us into it, and we watched like you all had like a marathon, right? Yeah, and I was like, "This is amazing." <laughs> yeah, it, it's incredible. I think you showed it. Did you show it to me? And Carlos showed it. We were all watching Carlos it together. Showed it to us. Yeah, and yeah, he's a fan. We were into it. Yeah, we were <laughs> He's a great actor in a Shire Dude videos. He's in. He's in a few of them. The well, Doge Fest one was really good. Yes. Yeah. Let me know if you ever need, uh, you know, I'm doing acting. something like that for Liberty Forum. Uh, I'll talk to you guys about that after the show. It's very hush-hush. It's the editing and the timing that, like, tells a separate story that you couldn't put into words. Mm, it's yeah. really funny. Yes. Yeah, so definitely go check out Shire Dude and go sum some Dogecoin. And uh, you can find my content at vrebel.com. And the show archives for this show is at rebelloveshow.com. We're also uh, go like us on Stitcher and subscribe to us in iTunes and watch this on YouTube. May subscribe to us there. And uh, we are out, guys. So uh, peace. Peace. peace.